is sitting in the Jubilee year, but we should reflect a little bit on the nature of God's mercy, and that's exactly what I want to do uh, this evening and again tomorrow. First, I'd like to say is that any gift of God is meant to make us more godlike. Or if you had Karen talk, talking about that, is when God gives us a gift, a gift to be shared, when God gives us the gift of his mercy, so that we could imitate the mercy of God. No wonder the gospel says, be merciful as your father is merciful. So to be received the mercy of God is a call to be apostles of God's mercy. And there's a little parable in the gospel, the one in Matthew chapter 18, the end of it there, the story of the unforgiving debtor. One has been forgiven so much and then it can't forgive a small amount. It's a story of someone who hasn't really understood the mercy of God. Because if he had understood the mercy of God and the nature of God's forgiveness, he would have forgiven the one that owed a small debt to him. It makes the point that it's important to make space for God's gift, to try to understand God's gift of his mercy, if we're going to pass it on to others. So this evening what I wanted to do really was to look at what happens when we meet the mercy of God. And the story that we all know best, I suppose, in the Gospel is the story of the prodigal son, or the prodigal father may be in a way because it's mainly a story about the father. But in that story, if you look at it very carefully, the prodigal son doesn't see himself either as son or a sinner. He doesn't behave as a son. He goes off to a far country, wastes his property in disgrace. And when he comes back, he makes up a story of himself. He doesn't see himself in, in, any, in any real way until he meets the father. And then when he meets the mercy of the Father, he discovers what it means to be a son and a sinner. The point I want to make is, I think it's an important point to get the divine mercy, is that to really meet God is to discover ourselves and to discover God. It's to come to know ourselves at a new level, at a new depth, as children of God and as loved sinners. It makes a huge difference to our lives and to come to know God as a God of mercy, a God of compassion. So reconciliation that we're looking at very much this year in the Jubilee year, it's really a meeting, a real meeting with God. A lot of our meetings aren't real meetings. We wear masks a lot of the time. I'm a doctor in my own place at home. Some might know him as a very good doctor and people have great confidence in him. I remember one of my neighbors going to see him one day with a pain in his back. And the doctor examined him quite thoroughly, but he couldn't find anything wrong. So he wasn't going to send him home saying he didn't know his job. So at the end of the long examination, he said to him, Do you ever have this before? He said, I did. He said, Two years ago. And he said, You have it again. We wear masks in life. We pretend a good lot of the time. And sometimes it's even wise to pretend because it, 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 you can't afford to shatter people's confidence. And that's what teachers do some of the times as I was doing my teaching myself and doctors and nurses do it as well, I'm sure. But what I'm saying is that if there's a, a real meeting with God's mercy and the story you've heard this evening is a good example of it, there's a real insight into yourself. There's also a real, a real understanding, a new understanding of God. And so in that story, the prodigal son, the elder son, he doesn't see himself as a son either. He sees himself as a slave. He's been slaving all the time in his father's house, and he never really meets the mercy of the father. He never really comes to know himself at any depth, and he never builds up any relationship with the father. It's a lovely story to describe what God's mercy involves. Because in, if, if the elder son was to really forgive his brother, You'd have to let go of his sense of superiority. You'd have to let go of his greed. Because that's probably what's there when the, when the younger son came back. He's probably afraid he'd lose a bit more of the land and he couldn't afford to do that. The Bible then gives a lot of examples, and I'm just one, I'll, that one will do for the moment, of the mercy of God that brings us to a new grasp of ourselves and a new grasp of the goodness of God. So I'd like to just focus this evening on the discovery of God, getting our picture of God right. Now, I really think that's the key to our own growth in faith and our own growth in the journey of life, is getting the picture of God correct. There are many pe pe pictures of God, many people come to God asking, a God is a God who gives me what I want. 
And some people never get beyond that. Canon Hume, in one of his books, quotes it in prayer written on the chapel wall somewhere in Switzerland of someone who wrote, I thank you, God, for not answering my prayer. For someone to realize the prayer was selfish, God didn't answer it. But have come to understand God in a new way that God knew what was best. So the first thing is to understand God, and God is mercy. God is love that forgives. St. Paul, in the letter to the Corinthians, in his second letter there, describes God as the Father of mercies. And that's our picture of God, and it's important to get it right. There was a book written some years ago by an American Episcopalian, Martin Bell, which he called The Silver Wolf. He does never describe God in the book, but he describes God as being always present, being all powerful, describes God as a wolf, silver wolf, a beautiful animal, strong. But of course a wolf can turn savage. And the point he was making in the book was that if that's the kind of God you believe in, then you'll never really trust him. Because you can't afford to trust a wolf, you can't afford to trust a silver wolf either. So what he was saying really was if that's your picture of God, it's going to be very difficult to pray. Because prayer depends on a relationship of trust, trust in oneself and trust in God. The God is rich in mercy. And the Bible describes in many ways that mercy of God. It describes God, God's quality, I suppose, above all, as friendship. And then what keeps friendship alive? And keeping friendship alive involves fidelity, it involves compassion, it involves understanding, and of course it involves forgiveness. That's the kind of God. And the other point he makes is that God is always searching out what is lost in us. God's mercy is a very active quality in God. Maybe that's the story Karim was describing for us there that there was only ease in our life, that there's only ease in some part of your life, there's something there that is not really belonging to God yet. God searches out the bits of us that are lost, the bits of us that are not living for him. And often the way it comes to us is a lack of peace. Robert Howe's own little book called The Moving in the Spirit, he says there in that book that if you face something regularly in bad mood, you're not meeting God in it. And some people face God in bad mood every Monday morning or when they meet certain kinds of people. And they're not really meeting God in those situations. They're not at peace. And that's God's way of saying, I want you to find peace in all of your relationships, in all of your days, in all of your meetings. And it's only when we meet God's mercy and allow God to change us that that can happen. So it's to allow God to search out the bits of us that are lost to him. I'd like to make then just a number of points with regard to the mercy of God because I think it's very important. Archbishop Pell in his lecture in UCD last week was saying that in, in his experience some people would describe God as unconditionally loving and radically undemanding. A kind of a God who makes no demands on you. And he says in, in that situation people see no need for struggle in their lives as Christians. They see no need for conversion. But he said the true picture of God, he says, is God who is unconditionally loving, but also radically demanding. God asks of us because he sees potential in us. He sees we can grow, and we often pay a great tribute to people by asking them to do something, by calling out the talents that they have. The first thing that the Bible, though, would insist on, and I think it's an important quality in the mercy of God, is first of all that God understands us. I think that's very important in our own relationships with people. If we're going to forgive a person, it greatly helps if I understand that there's a reason why someone abuses other people. Maybe there's been a story of abuse in their own lives. There's a reason why some people are violent. There's a reason why some people can make decisions. There's a reason why some people carry hurts from their past. And if I understand them and understand their story, and there's a different story behind, there, behind every face that we see, if I begin to understand their story, it's much easier to forgive. And the story of the, of, the, of the Bible is that God understands our struggle. God understands our story. I remember getting a lovely example of in a retreat I gave down in Athlone several years ago now. And uh, our sister was doing the retreat, she was you know, well in her 80s at the time. And she said to me, God would be very kind to me, she says, because God made me the way I am. She had a lot of problem in relationships. She wasn't getting on with people at all. She was awkward in many ways. But she understood a beautiful appreciation of God, that God gave me the temperament that I have, and God gave me the awkwardness I have. God understands that, and God will be forgiving. A beautiful grasp of the mercy of God.
a real understanding. Several years ago, someone gave me a definition of a friend as someone who sees through you and still enjoys the show. That's God. Because that picture of God right, it's easier to pray, and it's easier to ask for, for God's forgiveness. But the whole story of, you look at the letter to the Hebrews, and spent a long time there in the letter to the Hebrews, describing the, the, the Christ's compassion for us. That Christ became one of us, and he understands us, and John's Gospel says very neatly that he knew what was in the hearts of people. I think that's very important, that God understands our woundedness, our fragility, our mistakes and our struggles. Again, the late Karen and Hume might quote you the lovely phrase somebody said that we are all disabled, only with some of us it shows a bit more. And it does. Some are more fragile than others. Some hide, hide their weaknesses less well than others, that's the reality, but God understands. And that's why then the letter of the Hebrews will say, it's important that we approach God with confidence. I think that's a crucial thing that we sometimes fail to understand, that the mercy of God is first of all an understanding mercy. It's a God who appreciates our struggle, a God who sees our inner difficulties or turmoil, a God who understands our lack of peace, and a God who nudges us gently forward to find that peace. That's the first quality in God's mercy, the quality of understanding. The second thing I'll say about it is that God's forgiveness is not a shallow one. See, in life, sometimes forgiveness is very shallow. And some of you will have known, unfortunately, parents who never really correct their children, who never really let them make them aware that something is wrong. So there's no real correction going on and there's no respect. We've all seen it. We've seen it in classrooms, we've seen it in homes. No respect grows, but there's no appreciation. I've hurt somebody, I've injured somebody, I've let them down, I failed. But where, the, where a person becomes aware that I've done wrong, I've let people down, I failed them, I've hurt them badly, and then when there's forgiveness, there's reverence, there's respect. And that's what the Psalm 130 says beautifully. It says, with you is found forgiveness, and for this we revere you. When God forgives, it's a serious event. God makes us aware of where we have failed, not in order to make life difficult. We never experience God as oppressive. God is always setting us free, but he brings us to an awareness, and you find the stories in the Gospel, of in the presence of Jesus, many people felt their struggle. Zacchaeus became aware of his sin. The woman at the well became aware of her sin, her anger. Nicodemus became aware of his fear. In the presence of Jesus, they became aware of their own sin, not in a crushing way, but at the beginning of freedom. His mercy then is the one that and enables them to understand where they're at, and so when he forgives, there's a growing reverence and a growing respect. So forgiveness comes to us in different ways, and that's important in life, because again, our own experience varies a lot. Last year, during the confirmations, of one parish priest was saying a few words of thanks at the after communion at Mass, and he was saying he found that kind of difficult, because he lost his confidence early in life in kind of public speaking. He said he was, one Christmas, he was working at, he was in an altar by, an altar by I think, at the time, he was, doing some job fixing up the crib and there was a sister in the parish who was to walk around the sacristy. Whatever he was doing the crib anyway, it wasn't working out too well. She said, have you ever come out of there? She said, one ass is enough in the crib. To understand the mercy of God, then you find a lot of examples of in the scripture, the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, that God's forgiveness brings about a reverence, a respect, a sense of awe, and so to really meet God is to grow. The transfiguration, which is the theme for your conference, is, is the transfiguration that God's presence brings about in us. The third point I'd like to make with regard to God's forgiveness is when the God forgives, his forgiveness creates in us a new heart and a steadfast spirit. When we forgive, we, we try to let go of whatever happened. As someone said, when you forgive, you should bury the hatchet without marking the spot. But we do sometimes mark the spot and we remember it. We're not able to let go of it. We remember. But when, when God forgives, God enables us to live differently, and that's important. So you meet the stories of the Gospel where Jesus sends Zacchaeus away to be generous. He told people to go and sin no more. God's presence transfigures. 
His presence creates in us something different if we allow it to happen. And it's a slow process and we can sometimes think it happens very quickly. To give an example again of a priest who is a man knew, uh, knew of, with a lot of trouble with his temper, as some of us do have, and after a long 40 day retreat he felt he felt he really had been changed. He'd really met God during the experience of retreat. At the end of the long retreat they had a day of what they call a day of repose and went to the day off, so he left notice on his door before he went away. Uh, he's not here, he's risen. So that anybody came along that day, that's what they passed the found on his door. So anyway, he came back that evening and down for a cup of tea and he met some of his people on the retreat and he got some kind of a row rose anyway and he lost his temper again. He was disgusted. So he cleared off for a walk and when he came back, the notice on the door had been changed. He no longer said, he's not here, he's risen. He said, the dead arose and appeared to many. The story of God's mercy then is a story of a mercy that heals us in the very widest sense of that term. The lovely phrase in the book of Hosea and the Old Testament says that God heals our faithlessness and God enables us to be faithful. I think your own experience of prayer and the whole experience of divine mercy will have touched you in a good lot into that healing presence of God that comes to us in prayer. And again, so they are very powerful in the story we've just had before I talked this evening. The healing presence of God that touches the fears of Zacchaeus and touches the fear of Nicodemus, that touches the remorse and the, the guilt in the story of the woman at the well. The, the, the presence of God then is one that not only heals our past, but enables us to live differently, to unlive our story. The story of Zacchaeus is a story of leaving his greed behind and now living generosity. The story of the woman at the well is the woman leaving her guilt behind and replacing it with joy. The woman was forgiven much, Luke chapter 7, she loves much. What I'm saying is if we allow the mercy of God to work in us, it lives in our hearts and changes us dramatically and radically. And Paul can say that he actually rejoices in his weakness. He's been given a capacity, not only he was resenting his own weakness, because of holding him up in his own apostolate, but the mercy of God changed him and enabled him to live differently. So I think it's important that when God forgives us, he brings us back to a new relationship with him. And we know, I think, from life that friendship is a very healing effect. Really good friendships are very healing. Because with a really good friend, you can share your story. It's respected for what it is, and the person responds to it with sympathy and understanding. And a good, a good friend will always help you to grow beyond it. Friendship is a very powerful effect that way of drawing out the pain, of enabling us to leave behind the hearts of stone and to take on hearts of flesh. Friendship with God is that. It's a very healing one, but it's also transformative and powerful. In fact, the very meaning of the word conversion in the Old Testament is to come back to your roots. What for conversion is to return home. It's to come back to a right relationship with God, and relationships give energy. Relationships change us. Good relationships have a powerful influence in our lives, I think we'll all know a few friends in our own lives who have really changed us by their understanding, by their encouragement, by their listening, by their care. So the mercy of God then, according to Psalm 50, is he creates in us a new heart and a steadfast spirit. Gives us the steadfastness we need for the journey of life. Fourthly then, I would say that this mercy of God that transforms us, it does call for change in us. It calls for a new direction in life. So it's, it's utterly false to say that God is radically undemanding. If God is working to bring about change in us, what he asks most of us, of all of us, is to be available for that change. One of the favorite images used in the Bible is the image of God as a potter. Have you ever seen a potter working at clay? A potter shapes it, and if it doesn't work out right, he reshapes it. I a friend of mine telling me he bought a, a, a teapot lately, and the, the, the spout of the teapot was crooked. And he said it to the, to the potter who had made it. And the potter said to him, I forgot he said that clay has a memory. And when it's under pressure, it, it goes back to its original form. That's something of our own lives that, we well, like the clay, when we come under pressure, we often go back to our original, whatever we found most comfortable with. We kind of resist the change that God wants to bring about. 
And that's why in the Old Testament, very often anyway, sin is often described as resistance. It's resistance to the, to the Maker's instructions. It's resistance to the remolding. We have it in tomorrow's first reading story, a story from Isaiah. That God is doing something new with his people. But where they resisted before, God is going to bring about change. So to allow God to transform us is a call to take a new direction in life. To recognize, first of all, I suppose, where the struggle is. Former Prime Minister of Italy, some of you might have heard him, Giulio Andreotti, who was up in the news lately for a court case brought against him. He said somewhere very beautifully, he said that to think the worst of someone, he says, may be uncharitable, but it's sometimes accurate. He'd been around a long time, he was a fairly shrewd man, and some of the people he found he was dealing with, he thought the worst of them sometimes, and he was right if you kissed. But I'm saying the mercy of God, therefore, it does call for a new direction in life. It calls for decisions. Someone has nicely said that the purpose of life is life with a purpose. And the call of Christian life is to be decisive. Decisions based on the gospel. Insights translated into decisions. The story of Nicodemus is a good example in the gospel. The decision to go to Calvary. Not a lot of us didn't go there, but Nicodemus had met Jesus. His fear had been healed. He found a new freedom, and that led to the decision to follow Jesus all the way to Calvary and to risk his future on that relationship. The mercy of God then does call for decisions that give a direction to our lives, and it's his decisions that give a direction to our lives. Good decisions expand our freedom, and one good decision makes the next good decision easier. That's what gives direction. Vague resolutions don't change our lives. They tend to fall by the wayside. But well, we need to be decisive, and some people find that very difficult. I remember someone who was teaching theology, I won't say where, because I've been in different places myself. But he'd always give you the two sides of the story, the two different opinions. He'd never give you his own opinion. He found it very hard to make his own, make his own, make up his mind which was right. And the students decided to call him Kipper because he said he had two sides and no backbone. What I'm saying basically is that the mercy of God calls for new responsibility. To really appreciate the divine mercy is to appreciate that God calls us to take responsibility for life at a deeper level. A decision to choose life. A decision to put God first. A decision to make quality space for God in our lives. To live not for ourselves, but for him. C.S. Lewis expressed beautifully in his little book, The Great Divorce, in that book, C.S. Lewis is describing people's journey towards God and the struggle that they have of letting go. He's saying that people become attached to things in life, the things they were doing or things that they liked, and they find it very hard to let that go and move on to God. And in the book, he describes one person who's so busy raising money for charity that he's forgotten what charity is. I'm so busy about it. And somebody else was so busy preaching the gospel, he'd really forgotten who Jesus Christ was. He didn't have time for prayer. At the end of the book, he says, there are only the two kinds of people. There are those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says, Thy will be done. What he's simply saying is, we live either for God or for ourselves, there's no in-between. And the decision in life is to seek to live for God, and that means to live by the values of the gospel. The values of forgiveness, the values of patience, the values of justice, the values of respect. All of that is what he's talking about, as mercy of God calls for that kind of radical transformation. So in the Gospel we find Jesus saying, go and sin no more. Not to, not to go back to the old ways, but to choose life and put him first. Fifthly then I would say that the experience of God's forgiveness makes us into people of hope. That is very important at the present time. Because there is a crisis of hope in many parts of the Western world and certainly a crisis of hope in our own country among certain age groups, certainly among young people. Is there something worth living for if life doesn't work out? Relationships, the job, work, money. What, keep, what gives you staying power for life? And St. Paul would say to us that what gives us staying power is a good experience of life, a good experience of relationships, a good experience of God. And the experience, he says, of God's mercy gives him hope for the future. 
that God has given him much and God has much more to give. And he says in the letter to the Romans in chapter 5, verse 5, he says, our hope is not deceptive. Our hope doesn't let us down. Our hope doesn't become embarrassing. Our hope doesn't bring confusion. Those who have found hope in God, who have really met God in their own journey, they know that God has great things in store for them. A great writer of our century, died about 10 years ago now, a great Swiss theologian, Hans Urs von Balthasar, said that God is evermore. He said that God is never finished giving. And those who know God know that God has much more to give. It's the prayer of the Magnificat. His mercy reaches from age to age to those who fear him. The Magnificat is a very strong prayer of hope. As someone has experienced the mercy of God, I know that God's mercy will continue on from generation to generation, so lives in hope that God's mercy can understand, can heal, can transform them, and can give us a new direction. So the, a good experience of God, of being in touch with God's goodness, roots our hope very solidly. The God whom we have met in the past will be there for the future. And that's that psalm I mentioned, Psalm 130, is basically a prayer of hope in God's mercy. It's hope in God's pardon. With you is found forgiveness, and for this we revere you. So I think it's an important part of our own experience of the mercy of God is, is if you like, savoring that gift. In my experience of life, working with people, I often get people to look at their own story in faith. Now, if you look back on your own story in many ways, look at the events of your own life and the ups and downs in all of our lives, but those who look at their journey in faith and say, where was God in all of that? Where was God bringing me through difficult relationships, difficult experiences, that God provided help through a friend or through a bit of advice or through prayer or somebody I met on the road of life? And those who look at life in that way, they always become people of gratitude. That's my experience anyway. But those who look back in that way as observers of their own journey, God fills them with thanksgiving for where he has brought them to today through their own struggle. And those who are people of gratitude, people of thanksgiving, know there's much more to come. So thanksgiving is a very important root, source, resource for our own hope. And those who are thankful for the mercy of God and those who are appreciated that the mercy of God has touched their lives, they become people of gratitude and then people of hope. They know there's much more to come. God's mercy, then, is a mercy that brings us great freedom. That's something that you find all the way in the pages of the Bible, that God is a God of freedom. The lovely piece in the little psalm we use, those of you read it, you read it, prayer of the church on Saturday nights. There's a little psalm there, Psalm 4, and it's one little line in that strikes me very powerfully. It says, when I was in, in a narrow space, you gave me freedom. We're often in tight corners, we're in narrow spaces, we're under pressure. Our space can be crowded in different ways. You see people heading out, out, out the country the weekends, they find the city very crowded, and their space is kind of pressurized. We need space to be human, we need space to live. And the psalm is saying that while people may crowd our space, and deadlines may crowd our space, God is always a God of freedom. To meet God is to meet a God of space. And I found a lovely example of that a little book by Viktor Frankl called, Ma, 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 called uh, Man's Search for Freedom, I think it was. It's a story of his, his, of his escape from the concentration camp at the end of the World War. He was one of the lucky ones to be alive when the war ended in 1944. And he, when, he went, when he was released from prison, the concentration camp, he went out into the open fields. And the phrase that came to his mind, he said in his prayer was, when I was in a narrow space, you gave me freedom. Because he's always found God as a God of space, and a God who enlarges that space for him. So to meet God as the God of mercy is to grow in freedom, that we are set free from anxiety, set free from the hurts of the past, set free to live more courageously, more generously, more hopefully. That's all the words we find with the scriptures, and Paul says it several times, says, for freedom Christ has set me free. Read the story of St. Paul, it's a very powerful experience of being set free from carrying his past, in any way as a burden, and Paul's own past was marked by persecution and so on, but he left all that behind. He found a powerful freedom to the mercy of God. And he also says the Holy Spirit is a spirit of freedom. In his letter to the Romans again, he says in chapter 8, The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin. He's saying that freedom has been won for us on the cross, and if you want to understand the mercy of Christ, he says we see it clearly there on the cross, that the mercy of God goes to the, to the extent of giving all for us. 
humble, his forgiveness and reaching out from the cross, and in setting free those who gather to receive the fruits of Jesus' death and then the death, death resurrection. Those things, I think, help us to understand the nature of the mercy of God that we're trying to appreciate. And I think, first of all, and tomorrow I'm going to come back to some other aspects of it, but I think it's important that we learn to, to appreciate and understand the gift that is given to us. A mercy that understands, a mercy that really forgives, not in a shallow way, not in a superficial way, but in a serious way. A mercy that comes to transform us. It comes to change us radically and calls for new decisions. And then it calls on us to experience the mercy flowering in hope in our own journey of life. And that, I think, would be reflected in our own experience if we respond to it in that way. And I want to pick up tomorrow in some ways in which we can respond to it because the, the, there are a lot of ways in which we need to, I think, let the mercy of God into our own experience, to touch our lives in all the areas where there is resistance to God. And I want to pick up on some of those tomorrow. I remember someone who kind of caught in his own way was a, was a retreat director, really. He had a note on his door which said that God loves you and I'm trying. <laughs> he got it right, you know, he was absolutely sure that God loves you. He wasn't so sure about himself, but he knew that he was struggling at it. But he was waiting for God to transform him and to find that kind of, because love involves understanding as well as appreciation and drawing out the potential of people. It takes a whole lifetime to understand another person. So in some ways he was right. He was describing his own struggle. I want to say that because I think in today's world the picture of God is distorted. And in a sense, while we have been very, I think, done great things by emphasizing the last 20, 30 years, the compassion of God, the love of God, the goodness of God, but many people understand that only, only as a one-sided thing, that there's no call to change, there's no call to conversion, there's no call to grow, there's no call to struggle. It's interesting, the survey done in Ireland no, many years ago now, that only 50% of people believe there would be a hell at the end of the, the end of it all. You know, they said that the mercy of God will forgive us no matter what happens. Of course, the mercy of God is forgiving. God is forgiving. But the other side of it is that God does call us to be accountable for the gifts he has given us. So it is a mistake to trivialize our own responsibility. And I think there's something of that happening in, in life today. Certainly the, the, the felt need for forgiveness the felt need for God's mercy, the felt need for change, the felt need to look at our own journey and our own source of sin, that's just, just got weak in our own culture. In fact, the word sin is scarcely mentioned in our own culture because sin is seen as pulling me down, as negative. But what, what the scriptures would say is that awareness of our own struggle is the beginning of growth. Awareness of our own sin is the beginning of real freedom. And those who become aware of sin and God's presence are on the way to a new level of growth, a new level of freedom. In other words, it's saying that those who know they are loved by God, they can face their own sinfulness in God's presence without feeling put down, without feeling wretched. They can face it in the presence of a loving God, knowing that to really bring it into God's presence is to allow God to, 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 to enable us to let go of it and to go beyond it. That's why I want to begin this evening then by focusing on the picture of God, because there are many pictures of God in the scriptures, there are many pictures of God in life as well. So if we get a picture of God right, and the rest follows from there, our own journey, our own conversion, our own, our own reflection on life, it all fits in well. If we haven't got the picture of God right, then everything else is, 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 is distorted. A friend of mine used to say, there are some people in Ireland who have just about enough religion to make them perfectly miserable. And that's the God they've met. A God who's waiting to pounce. A God of fear. They've never really met a God of mercy. So that's my wish for you this evening, that you would understand the mercy of God and find the joy that comes from knowing the quality of his forgiveness. Thank you.
here than ever far Be how Maybe it can be to fall But open up your heart again For his love is never far And when you're hearing his words Spoken to you Spoken to me Spoken to everyone To hope Calling to love Calling to pray that we can be in a very bad that we can be when we embrace the will of our God in heaven. Let us walk in the love of the Lord. Let us walk in the love of the Lord. and forgiveness to and then you realize your value in his eyes and when you're hearing his word spoken to you spoken to me spoken to everyone to hope calling to love calling to pray that we can be in a very best that we can be when we break the will of our God in heaven, then let us walk in the love of the Lord. Let us walk in the love of the Lord. Let us walk in the love. <laughs>
Oh, 